My name is Gabriel Motzkin. I'm the director of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, and my job is to open events like this one. That's what I do for a living. That's what I get paid to do. And as always, I have to think up something to say, so I will do. But before I do, I want to th thank Simone Lenz and the Goethe Institute for their support of this event, without which it could not have taken place. So a great thank you to the Goethe Institute. Now, this event is called uh, Between Revolutions, Public Protest and the Rejuvenation of Marxist Categories. And when you see this term, you always have conflicted emotions because part of us always thought that Marxism was dead with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989. I remember thinking this is only going to make Marxism possible for the first time because there won't be an empirical Marxism for people to compare anything to so they can will be able to attribute anything at all that they wish to Marxist thought, which is all, what always happens when there's not an existing political system. I myself have no problems with the first part of the title and a great problem with the second part, and I'd like to be honest and lay it out, which is I have, I'm all for what's called public protest. And that's a great thing, and I'm for it. Marxist categories I have a lot more problems with than public protest, and I'll tell you why. And that is because uh, in our modern society, the notions of subject to object or class relations such as Marx had in front of his eyes may very well be applicable, but they are concealed. And since they are concealed, they have to be excavated. And the reason is that it was impossible in Marx's time that an electrician or a plumber could earn more than a professor. And therefore, relationships were income and class status were clearly correlated. But in our modern world, income and class status are not clearly correlated. And the question is, do we live in a world that's organized according to some kind of status determination in terms of social classes, saying a professor is worth more than an electrician or something like that? Or do we live in a world that's determined according to income levels, like the Americans do? In America, professors can, and I saw that, can leave the University of California at Berkeley to open a car dealership because they will make more money selling cars than being professors at universities. It's a very clear thing. There is no sense of status at all. Now, to my mind, this is a big question for any Marxist thought, because while we are all sympathetic to the idea of revolution, or what I would call Maoist thought, in the sense that we all believe that we constitute a reality, and we want to constitute a reality of social justice, and we want to do it through public protest, I'm not sure that the categories of Marxism are actually applicable. Now, I throw that as a challenge to the speakers, because they obviously, some of them, with, I hope, will contradict everything I say. That's the whole point of having an evening like this. So without further ado, I would like to invite Manuela Concelni, who is the chair, to lead the rest of the evening. I wish you all a great time. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm very happy to be invited to chairing this uh, panel, especially because following what uh, Professor Motzkin just said, I would say that all the abstract, at least the one that they arrived to me, they attempt to do a kind of rereading of some categories. And the one that fascinated me more is at least the one that Gramsci used about hegemony. If I could apply it to Amal, to Martin, and to uh, Anat. Um, and so according to Gramsci, power is based on the simultaneous presence of the force and of the consensus. If the element of force prevails, we have domination, kind of dictatorship. If the element of consensus prevails, we have hegemony precisely. We might conclude, therefore, that the hegemony is the form of power based essentially on the consensus, that is, on the ability to win to gain support of a given political and cultural project. So the moment of hegemony could be useful to unveil and taken as a cultural direction can be systematically revaluated in opposition of economism. With this word, I open the, the session. The first speaker is Dr. Martin Nonhoff, that is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Bremen. His main research interests are political theory, the history of political ideas, discourse analysis, qualitative methods, and economic policy. 
His recent works include, well, I will try with my German, the Germans will forgive me for that. Politischer Diskurs und Hegemonie, das Projekt Sozial Macht Wirtschaft in 2006, and Precare Legitimate Teni, Teni that came out uh, in 2010. Um, maybe I will introduce all the speakers because we will have a discussion at the end. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Anat Matar is a senior lecturer in philosophy at Tel Aviv University and chair of the Israeli Action Committee for the Palestinian Prisoners. Her latest book is Modernism and the Language of Philosophy that came out in 2006 by Rutledge. Recently, she has edited, along with Aber Baker, the volume Threat, Palestinian Political Prisoner in Israel, Pluto Press in 2011. Professor Danny Gutwein is associate professor of modern Jewish history at the University of Haifa. His work suggests focus on socioeconomic analysis of various aspects of Jew Jewish modernization, such as Jewish nationalism, mainly Zionism, modern and new antisemitism. He also used the socio this socioeconomic perspective to prove the economic social, political, ideological, and cultural ramification of the privatization process in Israel. Dr. <coughs> Amar Jamal is a senior lecturer at the Political Science Department of Tel Aviv University and director of the Political Communication Graduate Program. He served three years as the chair of the Political Science Department and is currently the general director of the Media Center for Aber Palestinian in Israel. His research field includes include political theory and communication, nationalism and democracy, civil society and social movements, indigenous minority politics, and civic equality. He has published extensively on Palestinian and Israeli politics. Four of his recent books are Arab Minority Nationalism in Israel, The Politics of Indigenity, that came out with Rutledge, The Arab Public Sphere in Israel, Media Space and Cultural Resistance, by Indiana University Press in 2009, the Palestinian National Movement, Politics of Contention, 1967-2005, Indiana University Press, 2005, Media Politics and Democracy in Palestine, Success Academic, Academic Press in 2005. The first talk, as I said, is uh, Martin Nonov, Hegemony and Economic Order is Post-Marxism Anti-Materialist. Please, Martin. Well, uh, Thanks for the introduction and uh, very, very many thanks for inviting me here. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope it's worthwhile having me invited. <laughs> okay, you already uh, announced the title, Hegemony and Economic Order, or is Post-Marxism and Materialism? We are surely living in turbulent times. Global capitalism lives through crisis after crisis. Millions suffer while few are becoming richer and richer. Hundreds of thousands in countries all over the world revolt against the national and supranational elites. In Tunis and Cairo, New York and London, Madrid and Athens, and last not least, in Tel Aviv and other Israeli cities, protesters are outraged by the satisfied self-legitimations uh, of financial elites and the behavior of politicians which surrenders to the markets misrecognizes social needs or turns to outright authoritarian measures in order to combat societal unrest. In much of the European media, we witness a witch hunt against entire countries such as Greece. And at the same time, in a surprisingly candid imperial move, the German ministers of foreign affairs or the treasury demand to get control of the Greek national budget. It is no surprise that in such a complex situation of economic crisis, political unrest, and international imbalance, there is an upsurge of interest in a theoretical paradigm for which the economics is at the heart of politics, Marxism. And yet, the global developments of the last two years or so are diverse in, in many respects, so obviously political that it might be necessary to resort to theoretical accounts that built on Marx, but at the same time try to extend Marxism's analytical scope. In the course of this paper today, I first want to sketch out what I believe to be the main reasons for the renewed interest in Marx and Marxism. 
Then, while not denying the many analytical strengths of Marxism, I will point to the more recent theoretical strands of post-Marxism because the latter takes into account insights about the contingencies of social meaning and power, uh, political power relations, insights which mostly stem from post-structural influences. Therefore, post-Marxism might in many cases have additional explanations for the great variety of popular resistance against the injustices of uh, capitalism and authoritarianism. In a third step, I will ask whether post-Marxism, due to its connection with post-structuralist uh, theories of language and meaning, is open to the charge of surrendering materialism or historical materialism. I think this may sometimes be the case, but is not necessarily so. Finally, I will show how a post-Marxist analysis of the hegemonic construction of economic order could be conducted. First part. If today, once more, Marxism is so attractive, this is probably due to at least five reasons. First of all, Marx's analyses of the capitalist economy are still compelling in many respects. I won't go into detail here, but it appears, for example, obvious that much of today's crisis can be understood as a crisis of overproduction and as a consequence of the fact that it is no longer as easy to incorporate new markets into the capitalist regime as, ha as it has been before. Secondly, Marx's social science aims to acquire knowledge for very concrete reasons. It wants to intervene in miserable, unjust, and exploitative social constellations. By creating better analytical tools and by looking at concrete historical developments, Marxism aims at a better understanding of how injustice and exploitation come about and how they will be overcome. While liberal science often combines pur purportedly objective observation and dis disinterested description, with an interest in raising the functionality of the existing economic and political regimes. The goal of Marxism in raising, uh, sorry, and any critical theory that follows it, is to produce an understanding of social pathologies, poverty, exploitation, oppression, that fuse them as conditions that can and will be struggled against. Thirdly, Marx makes clear that our understanding of things is inextric inextricably intertwined with our position in the material world. The relations of production and reproduction to which we are bound in our daily routines. This, however, means that there will be different views of the world depending on one's position. The ruling ideas in an epoch in, a, in particular can thus be understood as exactly that, the ruling, but not the true ideas. If political and economic elites tell us that we cannot regulate financial markets, that there cannot be high taxes on capital gains, that workers need to be careful about demanding higher wages and going on strike, if all this happens, we surely hear truths. But they are truths only from a certain position within the relations of production. Fourthly, Marxism comes with a clear moral and humanist stance. There is a human nature from which we become alienated in capitalist economy. Marxism carries the promise that this alienation will be overcome in a communist free association in which liberty, equality, and the right to material prosperity will eventually be secured. These promises, to be sure, were not kept in the states of real socialism but that does not weaken aspirations to make them come true in a new attempt. From these first points, we can conclude that much of Marxism's attractiveness results from a simultaneity sorry, of capitalism's ongoing pathologies and a promise of emancipation. To this we may add, finally, that Marxism reminds us that the ruling ideas as well as the prevailing relations of production will be heavily defended by those who rule and those who profit from them. In other words, Marxists know that capitalist societies remain antagonistically constituted 
even though this antagonism has been mitigated by modern institutions such as political democracy and the, social wealth and, and the welfare state. It is surely not the least part of Marxism's attraction that it allows us to understand that social conflicts are a necessary part of capitalism as against a liberal hegemony that knows only a plurality of private interests and some state mediating neutrally between these interests. Second part. So, Marxism can surely be considered an important source of scientific critical analysis and political commitment. And this becomes even more obvious in times of crisis. And yet I believe, following thinkers like Jacques Derrida, Ernesto Laclau, and Chantal Mouffe, that we must not stop thinking after we have that we must not stop thinking after we have ascertained Marxism's continuing importance. On the contrary, Marxism's own historical thinking should force us to reconsider Marxist knowledge in a changing historical and social setting. Since the 1970s at the, lit at the latest, we're witnessing a pluralization of social and political conflicts. While the antagonism between capital and labor has not really subsided, there is, beside class identity, a plethora, a plethora of other identities that give rise to new struggles. Usually re we refer, um, um, under the influence of an American-dominated discourse, to gender and race as other conflict categories. But there are, of course, more. Ethnic groups, conflicts between environmentalists and industrialists, or probably the most important and recent social struggles, between the old and the young. Even though it remains very visible and important, it is nowadays no longer clear that it is economic, economic antagonism which solely determines social struggles. Against this background, I think we are right to develop a new critical thinking that keeps what is so attractive about Marxism but goes beyond it in taking into account the lessons of a new historical situation. It is particularly three aspects that I want to talk about. Skepticism about Marxism's uncompromising claim to scientific truth, doubts about economic determinism, and the rediscovery of politics, particularly a radically democratic politics. To be sure, only very few thinkers have offensively used the label post-Marxism. But nearly all of those who are connected with the label, like I mentioned, Derrida, Laclau, Mouffe, we could also mention Rancière or Judith Butler, um, all of them are in some way connected to the field of post-structuralism and share some of its basic assumptions. Assum uh, among these assumptions, one particularly sticks out, the instability of linguistic meaning. The meaning of an element, of a linguistic element, depends on the one hand on its position within a relational structure and on the other hand on the specific speech situation in which it is uttered. The post-structuralist theory of discourse and hegemony as it has been sketched out by Laclau and Mouffe turns to this linguistic insight or turns this linguistic insight into a tenet of social and political theory. The identities of social and political actors can thus be understood in a fashion similar to linguistic meanings. They too are not simply given, but they come into existence in relation to other identities and in specific historical contexts. As soon as we acknowledge, however, that meanings and identities are part of a relational and versatile web then it becomes clear that from the many, many possible positions in this web, there will result a great number of perspectives. Thus, we cannot assume that one of those perspectives offers a privileged understanding of truth about social facts or about norms. Here, we find a first tension with Marxism, as the latter evinces uncompromising convictions about the truth of its scientific knowledge. Such self-confidence is barred for post-structuralist thinkers. This does not mean, however, that it is no longer possible to defend one's analyses with clear arguments and good reasons. But it is clear that the production of truth is always, and not only in the case of the ruling classes, 
connected to one's position in the world and that one has to invest one's own identity in this process of the production of truth. The second and mo maybe most conspicuous tension between Marxism and post-Marxism concerns the role of the economy. For Marxism, the position of social actors within the material world is crucial, yet this position is reduced to the position in the relation of production, in the relations of production. Here, we have the proletarian worker who has nothing to offer but his or her labor. There, we have the capitalist bourgeois who exploits the worker's labor and appropriates its surplus. Surely, the sphere of production and the relation between capital and labor is a substantial part of our social and political being. Where we stand economically will influence our perceptions of ourselves and of the world significantly. Nonetheless, the fact that the conflict between capital and labor has become the most important social conflict in the last 200 years should not make us overlook that there are also other forms of injustice and exploitation. I just mentioned the most important ones between men and women, between persons of different colors and different religions, between the old and the young, etc. Emancipation cannot be reduced to the emancipation of wage workers. To see all social conflict grounded in the relations of production appears myopic from a post-Marxist point of view. Following Gramsci's theory of hegemony, post-Marxism argues that the specific manifestation of social conflict is first and foremost a consequence of politics. Although economic factors will in many concrete historical situations remain important, neither the identities of groups nor the specific politics of alliance, nor the change of identities in the course of such politics can once and for all be reduced to economy. The new social movements of the 1970s and 80s, but also the alter-globalist movements of the 1990s and 2000, and then again today's widespread popular unrest, show that sexual orientation, gender, religion, or commitment for eco ecological justice or human rights can be as decisive for the alignment of social conflicts as economic position. It is most important to recognize that most likely none of these different identities on its own will be the single cause for a given conflict. In order to achieve cultural and political hegemony, it will be necessary to understand different identities and different demands as equivalent with regard to the goal of overcoming some counter-identity, some general crime, as Ernesto Leclau calls it. Only then will we, be a, will we be in a situation in which it is possible to advance, to advance a common struggle against different kinds of oppression and exploitation. The goals of such struggles encompass, to paraphrase Nancy Fraser, redistribution as well as recognition. The conflict between economic classes has by no means become meaningless. But situation in which the origin and telos, the good and the bad of entire societies, is decided e in economic terms only must be read as specific historical and not as universal constellations. Post-Marxism's rediscovery of politics has just been mentioned. With it comes one last development that differentiates post-Marxism from Marxism, the turn to radical democracy. Radical democracy does not mean a specific institutional arrangement, neither the common liberal parliamentary democracy that we are so familiar with, nor the, uh, some kind of extended direct democracy. And surely it will not refer to the many forms of the rule of experts and judges that ever more encroach upon our political systems. Rather, Radical democracy means that no single institutional framework can ever do justice to the self-rule of the free and equal. The point is that there is no irrefutable reason for this or that form of democracy, nor for this or that constitution of the demos itself. This is democracy's radicalism, that there is no ground for democracy except democracy itself, the practice of the free and the equal. Democracy will, therefore, never be achieved. It will always be on the retreat. 
democracy may be a thought, as Derrida proposes, may be thought, as Derrida proposes, as the coming democracy, the democracy of a new, without ever being realized. It bears the structure of a promise, but it is surely us who must stand up to this impossible promise, ever new, free and equal, without safe ground to stand on. This openness can and will be quite disquieting, and it surely comes with great responsibility. Third part. So what is Marx, post-Marxism about? The post and post-Marxism will surely not mean to leave Marxism behind or to overcome it in some general and universal sense. Quite to the contrary, post-Marxism sticks to, with, uh, to many aspects of Marxism. Its antagonistic understanding of society, its awareness of ideology, its critical drive. Even the importance of economy, no post-Marxist would really deny. She or we, he or she would, however, argue that economy is not all that matters, and that in two senses. Economy is not the only field which is important, and it is not the only aspect of materiality. And she or he would point to the crucial role of politics. Is there something that really constitutes, if there is something that really constitutes a break between Marxism and post-Marxism, it is this, the different weight that is attributed to the economy and to politics respectively. Neither do relations of production automatically constitute political domination, nor can political domination only be traced back to economic power. Finally, post-Marxists usually take language and discourse much more serious than most Marxists. Taken together, this consideration of linguistic structures and articulations, as well as the turn to politics, has provoked many critiques that post-Marxism has granted too much attention to phenomena of the superstructure and has thus lost the economic base out of sight. Post-Marxism is, in other words, charged with having become anti-materialist. What are we to make of this charge? First, it will have to be admitted that, indeed, differing from Marx and Engels, but also from Marxist theor theoreticians that are important for post-Marxism's own lineage, such as Gramsci and Althusser, um, post-Marxism has indeed given up the belief in determin determination by the economy in the last instance. If this were enough to argue the point of anti-materialism, the case would be won. However, I think things are not as easy as it appears. Rather, it seems that the line between base and superstructure is itself quite blurred. On the one hand, the economy itself functions as a to a large part due to elements that are very often not considered as being material. Beliefs, norms, expectations, promises, like in contracts or in futures, and last, but surely not least, money, that great metaphor. On the other hand, what is often called non-material might have more materiality to it than is often assumed. Let me give you three examples. First, let us examine the charge that post-Marxism's reliance on linguistic post-structuralism leads to anti-materialism. This argument, I would hold, misrecognizes the clarifications made by pragmatic linguistic theory and analytical philosophy in the 20th century. Particularly Austin's and Searle's speech act theory has made clear that we do things with words, things that have very material effects, such as marriage, divorce, promise, economic contracts, and the like. Beyond the single speech act, Foucault and other discourse theorists teach us that our knowledge, which is mostly based on language, is deeply intertwined with material reality. And even if language were considered mere words, it is important to remember that the most influential post-Marxist authors, namely Leclerc and Mouffe, made clear from the very outset that social and material elements behave like language elements, elements when their identity is concerned. It's not that they are language elements. 
Language and materiality thus become so intimate, intimately connected that it makes little sense to differentiate between them in some substantial sense of the word. This is also relevant for a second aspect. Politics is constituted through language. Power is upheld through language, more so than through guns. Domination and hegemony are always, to a large extent, formed through language. All this has enormous repercussions for our material reality. Pauline Gramsci, it is necessary to understand that politics, and not only the economy, is an independent, very material sphere of social struggle. Thirdly, one of the main insights of post-Marxism is that power, and, and here we could mostly look to... Um, to Judith Butler and Foucault, is that um, power works through the very materiality of the subject and its body. In this sense, relations of production are always also reconstituted through the subject's incorporation of standard routines and discipline. At the same time, subjectivity is constituted ever anew in hegemonic struggles against some other. The subject is never simply present and it is its enmeshment in material reality, consisting of the economic sphere on the one hand, but also of the political sphere and the sphere of daily life, for example, um, that, makes possible its uh, that makes possible its constitution, a constitution, uh, the constitution of the subject, which will never be completely successful and finished. The peculiar materiality of the subject has been under-theorized in Marxism. It is post-Marxism's strength um, to have made it a central aspect of critical social theory. All in all, we can conclude that it makes little sense to call post-Marxism anti-materialist. Rather, the line between materiality and ideas, between base and superstructure, between economy and politics is not as clear-cut as many believe. Post-Marxism is not anti-materialist. Rather, it has developed, I would argue, a broader perspective on how human subjects are linked with materiality. Fourth and final part. Let me finish with a short example of how political analysis within a post-Marxist framework could work. This example is taken from an in-depth study of West Germany's early economic policy after World War II. It shows how an empirical project inspired by the post-Marxist theory of hegemony allows us to understand how economic struggles are framed in political discourse. How, in other words, politics and economy do both together form an interdependent materiality. The goal of the research project was to find out how the hegemony of what Germans call social market economy in West Germany came about. The project was conducted as a discourse analysis. However, following Leclau and Muff, it, I used a broad understanding of discourse, encompassing not only articulations of linguistic elements, but also uh, articulations of all socially relevant elements, such as actors, of the demands that actors utter and write, of political institutions like pension scheme, and so on. Social market economy is a very specific German discourse formation, clustered around a number of demands that were, interestingly, until the late 1940s, often deemed antagonistic. Most conspicuous in this regard are maybe the demands for, for market economy and political regulation of the markets, free market prices and political intervention in the market, reliance on the market and social policy. The success of social market economy can be traced back from early economist publications around 1946 to speeches by liberal and conservative German politicians in the years of the uh, Allied occupation from 45 to 49, and then to the first election party platform of the Christian <coughs> Democrats in 1949. Interestingly, the Christian Democrats at the time uh, vacillated between ideas of planned and market economy. The concept of social market economy allowed them to unite differing views of conservatism, liberalism, and political Catholicism, all of which were important influences in the party. 
but also by using the label it became possible to assemble a quite surprising, rather weird coalition of enemies. So we find among the enemies communists and socialists, for, to be sure. But also, together with the communists and the socialists in the same camp are what they call Manchester liberal, liberals and national socialist plan, planned economy. And all of these forms of economy were supposed to be overcome by what is called social market economy. What we see here uh, in a, in a Leclerian um, analytical framework is how different chains of equivalence, how many, many actually very diverse enemies are put together in one chain of equivalence, as I just mentioned, and then again, many demands that are also antagonistic in some sense are also put in one line and then two lines are confronted with each other in order to form that hegemonic project. Quite soon, it became then clear that the ideas of social market economy would be able to, to transgress party boundaries of uh, the Christian Democrats. This was particularly the case because some very popular economic and social policy measures of the Adenauer government in the 1950s, like the pensions reform, were advertised as being what social market economy was all about. In 1959 it was that the Social Democrats then set up their first post-war general party program, the so-called Godesberger Programm. And this program encompassed most of the demands that were usually connected until then with the Christian Democrat social market economy. However, the Social, de uh, the social Democrats did not use the exact label of social market economy until the 1990s. During the 1960s, then, the former alternative of democratic socialism was de facto given up, although it remains part of the Social Democratic Party program until today. But nowadays, practically all political forces from the left-wing Linkspartei to the neoliberal FDP, from employers to unions, all of them follow the banner of social market economy. So we are definitely facing a situation of a hegemony of an economic paradigm. Not all of the political forces, to be sure, will mean exactly the same thing when they talk about social market economy. But the preponderance of the discourse formation nonetheless has significant repercussions for the social and economic situation in Germany. Most importantly, maybe, social market economy is closely connected to what Germans call Sozialpartnerschaft, which translates roughly into social partnership between employers, associations, and unions. This means that labor and capital consider each other as partners with diverging interests, but still as partners, not as antagonists. The result of this that there are, is that there are very few strikes and that it was possible to have only very low wage gains since at least 1990. Real wages basically stagnated since then. Only due to this, and thus, due to the discourse formation around social market economy, Germany was able to gain the comparative advantage that makes it today one of the leading export nations. But at the same time, it also makes Germany one of the most important destabilizing factors in the Eurozone, and also vulnerable to an imperial discourse. With this, I close. I hope that I could not only convince you of the value of some post-Marxist uh, categories and ideas, but that I could also show you, though only very briefly, how one can conduct materials analyses within such a framework. Thanks for listening. Yes. Okay. Because half of us can't hear and we leave lips and stuff like that, so we have to face us much easier. I'm out. Okay. Okay. So we will um, we'll ask Martin to out. read yeah. it again. Okay. 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 So okay. now, yes. All right. So our next speaker is Anat Matad. She will talk about uh, ethics <coughs> versus politics in the <coughs> spring of protest. Thanks very much. And of course, I didn't know that in advance, but I think it's going to be a sort of complementary
comment to Martin's to Martin's lecture. Um, do you hear me? I don't hear myself very well. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'd like to address our topic today by returning to a small book. This is a small book. Um, a small book which impressed me very much when it was published back in 2007. Oh, thanks. The book, Infinitely Demanding, Ethics of Commitment, Politics of Resistance, was written by Simon Critchley, a British philosopher, currently professor of philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York. Critchley's book combines a meta-ethics, largely influenced by Kant, based on the concepts of approval and demand, with a phenomenological approach to ethics and to subjectivity, which combines ideas of Levinas, Badiou, and Lacan, among others. At the center of the book is a theory of ethical subjectivity based on a Levinasian relation to an infinite demand originating from an other. This is, this is why, one of the reasons why it follows through uh, this thread. Uh, so at the center of the book is a theory of ethical subjectivity based on a Levinasian relation to an infinite demand originating from an other, which metaphysically precedes, or indeed annuls, the modern archic subject or self. Hence, this, uh, this proposed ethics is anarchic. Now, he, he ridicules in a way because what he's going to support, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, he's going to support anarchist politics, and, but he finds this anarchism of Levinas contributing to, to his project. Critchley's aim is a, in a from which political theory and practice in the 21st century could be formulated and justified. The book ends with this proposal, based on the above analysis, to develop an ethically committed political anarchism, as I said. Upon its publication, infinite, in, Infinitely Demanding has received a lot of attention, which culminated in the publication in August 2009 of a special issue of the journal Critical Horizons, dedicated in its entirety to polemics around the book, who contributed, among others, were Zizek and Badiou. Both are mentioned in the book. My own interest in the book was aroused as I have been involved in a writing project about the role of ethics in liberal democracies. To state it very briefly, I propose to follow Marx, Nietzsche, and Foucault, among others, in taking this role to be mainly an instrument of cons conservative powers, a tool which is, in the best case, hypocrite, and in the worst case, oppressive, the tool of ethics. Just to make it very clear. I don't like ethics. <laughs> uh, Fritchley presented me with a challenge. Contrary to my own inclination, he emphasizes the importance, indeed vitality, of ethics for political thought and practice. Yet unlike most of the writers sharing this stand, <coughs> Bridgley's motivation is primarily political, rather than self-indulgent, which, which is typical to other ethicians. What is more, it is political in a way with which I, I wholeheartedly sympathize. It is concrete and actual, aligning with radical leftist criticisms of the current political situation and supportive of resistance through acts of civil disobedience and refusal. In short, right, right up my alley for those who know me. Mm. Moreover, the recent events which are the focus of our attention today, the waves of protest which started in Tunisia and Cairo, continued in Europe, mainly in Greece and Spain, astonished us for several summary months in Israel and in various <coughs> occupied U.S. cities. Uh, the protests that are still very much alive in many of these places today, notably at the moment in Syria, made the book particularly relevant, indeed almost prophetic, both in the way it portrays these youth goals and what might be called their political manners, something far deeper than mere tactics, so, something in the form of life, I would say, using Wittgenstein. The general outline of this portrayal is adopted by Critchley mainly from David Graeber, and this is the man, there was just an article about him last week in The Marker, so I brought him here. And this is no coincidence that there was an article about him in the last issue of The Marker, you'll hear why. Uh, so the general outline uh, of this portrayal, of Critchley's portrayal, is adopted by Critchley mainly from David Graeber, 
whose advocacy, uh, advocacy of postmodernist anarchism and nonviolent resistance is commonly conceived nowadays as a, or maybe the, major inspiration behind the American protest movement inaugurated as Occupy Wall Street. So he is the man behind Occupy, both in deed and mainly in thought. All this is pretty impressive, and I think Richie deserves full credit for identifying the once implicit seed that eventually blossomed in the spring of protest. However, there are also the failures, temporary failures, permanent failures, but they are the failures of these same protests. Tantawi's military rule and the expected victory, or I, don't, I haven't heard the news today, but maybe it's already a fact, the victory of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the victory in Tunisia of the Nahda religious party, and in Spain of the conservative popular party, the almost total dissolution of the Israeli protest movement, and the relatively marginal effect of the Occupy movement in the US and Britain. What do these failures, albeit temporary, I hope, may teach us of Critchley's main message? I shall not elaborate here on the particularities of Critchley's ethical and meta-ethical positions. In fact, I do not even wish to engage in a detailed examination of the anarchist political program proposed at the end of the book. Rather, I'd like to question the role of the appeal to ethics in light of those recent political developments. Critchley, Critchley states several times that the present experience of political disappointment of liberal democracies, I quote, provokes the need for an ethics or what others might call normative principles that might enable us to face and face down the present political situation. Yet despite his meticulous analysis of the present crisis and ongoing injustice, he does not offer any argument for his statement that it is ethics that is needed as an answer to this situation. The reasons for this could be his strong intuition that this simply must be the case, that we simply need ethics. As Frege said, I, always, I almost always quote him, so again here, as Frege said, we are all too ready to invoke inner intuition whenever we cannot produce any other ground of knowledge. So Critchie has a very deep intuition that we must appeal to ethics. Other than that, there's hardly any argument, but I'm going to extract an argument for him. Yet Critchley is not totally blind to his intuition cum argument, for he does mention, en passant, the hostility of, uh, to ethics that one finds in Marx and in many Marxist and post-Marxist thinkers. But he does not bother to inquire into the roots of this hostility. Why is that? This question is doubly interesting, since Critchley leans heavily on Marx's work. He points quite efficiently and accurately, I think, at some of the malaises of uh, neoliberal, ultra-capitalist present-day democracies and traces his, an his analysis back to Marx, declaring that Marx is, for him, the sine qua non, I quote him again, the sine qua non for the understanding of contemporary socio-economic life. What he finds un unsatisfactory in Marx is mainly his materialist history. That is the idea that once the economic laws of motion of capitalist society have been laid bare, then revolution will follow quasi automatically from the contradictions and crisis in the capitalist system. For Marx, this necessity is the result of a class structure which gradually evolves into the opposed poles of bourgeoisie and proletariat, and subsequently leads to a seizure of power by the revolutionary pro uh, proletariats. Now even devout Marxists find it hard in our time to accept this picture in full traditional Marxism. It does indeed seem that the condition of possibility of the proletarian revolution is not that straightforward, that Marx's class structure was oversimplified, and moreover, that even though socio-economic conditions are crucial to any account of historical changes, past, present, and future ones, they are not the sole factors, as we just heard from Martin in a more elaborate way. Um, Gramsci and Laclau, exactly, Gramsci and Laclau's appeals to the notion of hegemony, leadership of political alliances, may hint at a way of overcoming the rigidity of initial Marxist, uh, Marxian analysis. And Critchie does well in endorsing such appeals, as well as attempting to move beyond them to combine with the idea of what he dubs true democracy, democracy is a movement of de democratization. Again, we just heard about that. Uh, true democracy, democracy is a movement of democratization, or perhaps what Derrida, 
who for some reason isn't acknowledged by Critchley, would have called the democracy to come. The idea of true democracy entails for Critchley condemnation of the aspiration to a full incarnation of the universal in the particular. I, I'm going to read that sentence again because it, it, it's a key sentence. So the idea of true democracy entails for Critchley condemnation of the aspiration to a full incarnation of the universal in the particular. That it is the concept of truth, true democracy, the concept of truth that is utilized here is therefore of special interest. I'll soon come back to this point. True democracy necessarily transcends the particular state and indeed constantly challenges its stability. Within classical Marxism, state, revolution, and class form a coherent set. There is a, a revolutionary class, the universal or classless class of the proletariat, whose communist politics entails the overthrow of the bourgeois state. But with the fragmentation and multifaceted nature of the notion of class, this vision can no longer be, be sustained. Critchley argues, I quote him again, to put it at, it most, uh, uh, at, its, uh, at its most understated, it seems to me that we cannot hope at this point in history to attain a complete withering away of the state. We are stuck with the state. It is at this point that Critchley finds the appeal to ethics essential. For whereas in traditional Marxist theories, the idea of sufficient possibility conditions of the next political stage, stage revolutionary or non-revolutionary, was conceivable, it is no longer so with post-Marxist visions, whose open-ended essence seems to contradict such conditions. In other words, when the political reality is imminently fractured rather than structured, motivated by a host of forces and not exclusively by socio-economic ones, and aspires towards a moving target, the engine of history cannot be reduced to causes. What is needed, if not causes, what is needed is deliberate political action, which El Ipso asks for justification. For deliberate political action, we need justifications. And the ultimate justification is naturally to be found in ethics. This conclusion, I believe, is indeed shared, albeit with differences in nuances, emphasis, and also results by Derrida as well, and I think with, by Martin as well. Mm. As I noted earlier, Critchley finds the ethical stance of some contemporary anarchists particularly suitable to the kind of political situation we are stuck with, since it is the stance that denies, more than any other political position, the privileging of a specific particularity because it is believed to incarnate the universal. This is, this is the enemy, incarnation of the universal. Democracy as democratization is the movement of this incarnation that challenges the borders and questions, uh, and questions the legitimacy of the state. True democracy is hence a decentral practice based mainly on conscientious civil disobedience tactics. The conception of anarchism Critchley wishes to defend is not so much organized around freedom, he says, as around responsibility. An infinite responsibility that arises in relation to a, a situation of injustice. This is an anarchism of infinite responsibility rather than unlimited freedom, even though the goal of responsible action might be the cultivation of the other's freedom. Influenced by Levinas' metaphysics of subjectivity, Critchley's notion of responsibility isn't read in direct relation to the situation of injustice. It is the otherness that yields the raison d'etre of my action. Responsibility and conscience seem to be interchangeable terms, therefore. They explicate one another. I mean, we think of conscientious uh, deeds, conscientious refusal, for example, and responsibility as interchangeable terms. Yet Critchley is aware of the risks in adopting a Levinasian anarchic ethics to cool. He knows very well that no infinitely demanding face of an other may serve as a springboard for political action, since the purity of such ethical moment is, an, is as empty as formal logic, at least as Kant would have it. Frege, not. Indeed, echoing, echoing Kant, he declares, if ethics without politics is empty, then politics without ethics is blind. Yes resonating strongly from Kant. There is no ethical experience and no simple deduction from ethics as the relation to, uh, to the other to politics as a relation to all others, he says. 
But if this is the case, we would expect the specification of the political content, the particular political content, which would fill in the otherwise empty ethics. The problem is, though, that Kutli cannot provide us with such content, since particularity is always saturated. By definition, it is particular. Particularity is always saturated. It incarnates the universal. We realize now that the political supplementary needed to combine with the otherwise empty ethics cannot but be procedural. And contemporary anarchists, with their creative, heartwarming, street theater, festival, I quote him again, his lovely depiction of what anarchists do, uh, heartwarming street theater, festival, performance art, and what might be described as forms of nonviolent warfare, provide precisely such, such procedural politics. Now, as I've entered at the outset, in my own political practice, I not only sympathize as an aloof supporter with anarchist groups, but actually take active part in precisely such actions as referred to by Critchley. However, I believe that as a political vision, anarchism cannot be enough. And it cannot be enough precisely because of its imminent fear of saturated, incarnated content, of truth. Here, for example, is how this fear is exp expressed by David Graeber himself in his Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology, which he quotes from the, this book as well, and I, I'm quoting directly from Graeber here. So here's the quote from Graeber, the anarchist. Stalinists and their ilk did not kill because they uh, dream, dreamed great dreams, but because they mistook their dreams for scientific certainties. This led them to feel they had the right to impose their visions through a machinery of violence. That was Graeber. The reference to Stalin is not accidental. We all are horrified by memories of the Stalinist regime. Yet Graeber's comment takes Stalin, which is not exactly Stalin, it's Stalin uh, as a symbol, takes Stalin to represent any aspiration to a full incarnation of the universal in the particular. It is the fear of dogmatism, he says. It is the fear of dogmatism, of a genuine engagement in some particular content from acting in the name of truth. This quote can be heard throughout his essay, and I believe it underlies Critchley's philosophical and political attitude as well. And coming back to the theme I'm interested in, it accounts for his need of ethics. I just quoted Critchley's expressed wish to organize this conception of anarchism not so much around freedom as around responsibility. But one of the most profound insights underlying Marx's political analysis is that freedom is not dividable, that unless everyone is free, no one is free. Nelson Mandela expressed the same insight in these memorable words. I quote at length, actually, from Mandela, but it's such a wonderful quote, you, you, you'll be happy to hear it. A man who takes away another man's freedom is a prisoner of hatred. He's locked behind the bars of prejudice and narrow-mindedness. I'm not truly free if I'm taking away someone else's freedom, just as surely as I'm not free when my freedom is taken from me. The oppressed and the oppressor alike are robbed of their humanity. Now, both Marx and Mandela do not single out actual wardens in, our, in actual prisons, of course. They do not even address only those who directly perpetuate oppressing practices. But they do not address our responsibility and conscience either. They simply present us with a rather saturated political concept, one which may spur political vision and action. I believe it would be a great distortion to depict the spring protesters throughout the world, everywhere, in the last year, is motivated by a formal responsibility towards infinitely demanding others. It would also be a mistake to think of them as simply practicing anarchist dissenting methods. I'm quite confident that these protectors and protesters act in the name of truth, no less. True democracy, indeed. But what they need is not the ethical foundation motivating their actions, but on the one hand, a fearless metaphysical account of truth, of saturation in postmodernist world, and on the other, a concrete political vision that would serve as a viable alternative to what seems now as an undefeatable militaristic capitalism. Thus, it is important for me to make clear 
that in criticizing Critchley's uh, appeal to ethics as a foundation for political action, I am far from endorsing any kind of royalty and pragmatism. My argument isn't meant to be directed against any kind of philosophical foundation for political practice. On the contrary, a detailed philosophical account of the possibility of law in post-liberal culture seems to me indispensable, as is a re-examination re of the notions of statehood and citizenship. A philosophy of subjectivity and otherness must also be articulated, since both the Cartesian and the Levinasian conceptions turn out to be too loyal to the traditional liberal capitalist order. But one thing that is needed, is not needed, in this philosophical foundation is ethics. Ethics, I believe, is a residue of precisely the same liberal democratic thought that both Critchley and I wish to eventually transcend, to overcome, of heaven. Looking at our political and philosophical realities from a post-Marxist perspective, or a Marxist or post-Marxist perspective, the discourse of responsibility comes out strikingly close to Victorian charity discourse. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel Gutwein, and that he will talk the middle, the middle class protest, the 2008-2011 economic crisis, and the left neoliberal trap. the current uh, wave of protest around in Israel, Greece, the indignados in Spain and elsewhere have taken many by surprise. And um, I want to question this surprise because I think that if we're speaking about globalization, neoliberalism and so on, we've been accustomed to hear that the world is global, markets are unified, uh, currencies are interdependent and um, everyone has to obey the rules of the market. <coughs> what has been missed in this neoliberal analysis is of course the class question because this neoliberal economy had formulated a new class what might be called the impoverished middle class. We've been so accustomed to speak about banks, about capitalists, about corporations, uh, that we have overlooked the very basic um, reality that the new neoliberal economy had reproduced a new class. It was a gross ex exaggeration, I would say, that like uh, the Industrial Revolution, had produced the proletariat. So the neoliberal era had reproduced the impoverished middle class, which I will call from now on just the middle class. The protest <coughs> of the last summer in Israel, and I will go from the global to the local, from the theoretical to the political, uh, the last uh, wave of protest in Israel which is very similar in its reasons if one goes through the analysis that I will suggest in a minute, which is very similar to the uh, reasons that um, build the wave of protest in the United States. Uh, the similarities it is, are astonishing. Uh, is the protest of a middle class that is a, the dismantling of the welfare state and making for the first time since the Second World War, a middle class without hope. A middle class that witnessing the realities that until now we have identified with the poorer classes, of not controlling their life, of being uh, dependent on charities and so on. Now, from a Marxist perspective, this question of class, of this new class, of, of the new material, of the materialistic reasons that had produced this class, 
has been overlooked in the discussion of past Marxist or new Marxist discussion of the last 20 or so years. As Martin and in another way Anat have pointed out, we have been more interested in this culture, with minorities, <coughs> gender, and so on. Uh, and we have turned to understand, when we have told that these factors are the factors that are determining the politics of the new liberal era. What I want to argue here is that not only post-Marxism or neo-Marxism are, from a Marxist perspective, a sort of neoliberal ideology. And I would say that post-Marxism or neo-Marxism is a neoliberal ideology. That if it is the superstructure, which is very, from my point of view, this uh, notion of superstructure is greatly missing, is grossly missing from the Marxist discussion of hegemony, of the Clau and move, and so on. Because if we understand that there is the base, there is a superstructure, one should ask what is the superstructure of the new liberal economy? And I would suggest that this superstructure is what we call postmodernism, in another way, what we call new Marxism, which is, and I'm referring to Martin's talk, which is very much anti materialistic in the sense that it wants to reduce the role of materialist analysis in our life. Not that it is not making allowance for the materialistic factors, but in the fact that it is reducing them, I am pointing out that it is, in a way, anti-materialistic. Now, what happened is in, that in the last 30 years, the new Marxist, post-Marxist um, analysis has <coughs> endorsed the neoliberal notion that indeed there is one economy, that the rules of the economy are very clear, they are the, <coughs> the markets are ruled by the corporations and all the, consen the Washington consensus and I won't, <coughs> I won't uh, elaborate on it here, uh, and have overlooked the fact that the major, one of the major projects of neoliberalism was dismantling the welfare state. Now, what is middle class? Middle class is the class here in Israel and in the United States, the class that if we are taking his, only his salary, he would live in a very low standard of life. What have made the difference for the middle class is the services supplied by the welfare state. Middle class minus welfare state services is lower class. And uh, this, uh, I would like to say that this is a very, uh, very rough definition, but it is a very uh, practical one. So, by dismantling the welfare state services, neoliberalism has turned the middle class into a sort of a new lower class. Now, if we understand from history that the, lower, the middle class is the class that has, had, had, has interest in politics, in culture, and so on, neoliberalism, by dismantling the welfare class, by making education dearer, but making life harder, have turned the middle class into a class that is less political. And less political, and I think that is the second 
project of neoliberalism to depoliticize the modern state to make it to make all the possible oppositions that are rooted historically in the middle class um, weaker and they succeeded in a way the middle class here in Israel elsewhere in Britain Tony Blair and other uh, well-known uh, examples uh, have made uh, have incorporated the middle class into the fantasy or into the fallacious uh, new world of neoliberalism where everyone has the fair opportunity, fair opportunity in the market. The cause was that the middle class which generally compose a very important segment of the socialist parties had left them. And uh, the decline of socialist parties in major here in Israel and in Europe, in the state the Democrats, is very much connected to this depoliticization that neoliberal uh, economy had forced on them. This mantling of the welfare state had further implication. And, it, and, it, and uh, this implication is that the middle class has begun to think about for a very, uh, for a very decisive period, that is of the 80s and the 90s, had here in Israel and elsewhere, had thought of itself as a part of the new market class, of the new neoliberal world. And, that, and this dream, or this fallacious understanding of the situation is very, is, is very decisive. Because if you are taking what enabled the, cap the corporation, the capitalist forces, to dismantle the, um, the uh, welfare state, it is the cooperation of the middle class. The, co the middle class cooperated with the policy that make him the poorer class or which is home depoliticization, which is the same. If we are taking that middle class is lower class plus lower, uh, <coughs> plus, uh, plus uh, social services of the, uh, of the welfare state, then the depoliticization of the middle class had made it uh, very dependent on the market, that is, which means he has lost his forces and his uh, influence. We see it very, uh, very clearly here in Israel. In Israel, the Labour Party, um, which has ruled Israel until 77, and if we're taking, <coughs> making, uh, we're taking in account the history, uh, the social and economic history of Israel, the decade between, before 77, that is to say when the Likud right-wing party came into power, this decade was the social democratic decade of Israel in terms of um, developing social services and in uh, lessening social gaps. Now, what have made, what the right-wing coalitions that came after the 77 um, elections made is not only what we generally speak about is the uh, policy in the territories and uh, all these uh, questions of political, uh, um, political and <coughs> uh, strictly political sense, but they have begun the neoliberal era in Israel. And you can see that uh, step by step they have dismantled the welfare state and the middle class has lost his the ground. His social ground, his political ground, but at the same time but at the same time it cooperated with it. 
Look, we have here in Israel this combination of um, governments of national unity. They are united about the politics against, uh, uh, <laughs> towards the Palestinians. They weren't uh, united with the politics uh, regarding the peace with Syria. So they were united only with one thing, and that is privatization, dismantling of the welfare state, which was very, uh, which the left, saying the coalition of Avoda and Meretz, for example, have uh, contributed their share very, very uh, strongly. I will just remind you that, uh, of course, the right wing Likud had contributed a lot to the privatization, but it was Rabin's second government that was the most decisive. Hmm? Not only Shochat, it was, uh, it was all this, uh, and, uh, uh, it was Rabin's, Rabin's second government, which concluded the Oslo Accords with the Palestinians was the government that, dismant that is uh, made the most decisive way of dismantling the Israeli welfare state uh, with the um, uh, law of uh, national uh, um, health security and uh, which privatized actually the labor market in Israel and so on. So, why was it possible? It was possible that inter because intellectually the Israeli left had begun to think in these notions of post-Marxism, of hegemony, of culture, of multiculturalism. What we were taught in these years, in the 80s and the 90s, was what, imp that the, what is important is not, are not class relations, but <coughs> cultural relations. You have never, you could hardly hear in Israel any debate about class relations, but you could hear more, um, <coughs> many debates about relations between religious and non-religious, between periphery and central Jews and Arabs, and so on and so forth. So, the, the um, category of class disappeared. And in this, it disappeared as part of endorsing the superstructure of neoliberalism, which one of two of its facets were multiculturalism, postmodernism, and so on. And I think that the question is not only what did post-Marxist thinkers thought. I think that the Marxist analysis of post-Marxism the analysis that asks why in this specific era why Foucault had become so popular in the Thatcherite era. Was it just coincidence? What made the endorsing of Gramsci's hegemony which, as I told, said before, that it is anti-materialistic because it is less materialistic in, in this context. Why Gramsci had suddenly, in this neoliberal era, became so popular? So you see, why, why the notion of civil society? Who heard about civil society until the 80s? It was rediscovered as a popular notion, not as a philosophical term. So if you are taking these three areas of postmodernism now, uh, <coughs> multiculturalism, Gramsci, civil society, this is a very clear superstructure that served neoliberalism. Because what was, what, was the, what was the conclusion? The conclusion was, of course, that the state 
um, is the source of evil. But it is, it is the oppressor. So I would say that the anti etatism of neoliberalism had, <coughs> had been resonated in the post Marxist thought. And I think that this similarity is very important that neoliberal thinkers and let's say multicultural thinkers or civil society thinkers became to the same conclusion operatively not philosophically and here I want to come to the role of the state in this kind of wave of uh, protest if you are reading while well, speaking, we are hearing about what is going now with the Eurozone, we are speaking, um, and uh, I will throw just a little light on uh, the currency problem. Three, I think that's two or three or a month ago, Gordon Brown, the late uh, <coughs> British Prime Minister, has issued a very interesting article, let's say, to the G20, the G20 were convened and he said, see, if we want to solve the currency problems of the world, it won't be solved by the banks. It won't be solved by the private banks, it will not be solved by the, um, by the, uh, um, by the, uh, I just thought, uh, it will not, uh, the, uh, some, something wrong with the bank. Um, okay, uh, I will make a point and stop. Um, so Gordon Brown said, you see, if you want to solve this problem of the, uh, the international monetary crisis, the governments should step in. It is a political problem. It is not an economic problem. It would not be solved by the way, there was a, a report by the UN that said at the same time, I think it was connected with the G20, but said that the same thing, roughly, Gordon's Brown's, uh, Gordon Brown's um, <coughs> words were uh, very much like those of the UN report. Uh, because I have only, two, only five minutes, I will come back to Israel. If you are speaking about Israel, the question is, how are we going to solve the middle class, and of course the lower classes, problem? And here I have, I think it will not be any, uh, I think it is just general belief, that the only solution to the middle class crisis that has been, that has <coughs> drived out so many Israelis in this summer, is the re-establishment of the welfare state. And this is the, the most important political project that the Israeli left, or Israeli socialist, or Israeli Marxist have before them. The re-establishment of the Israeli um, welfare state. I, I will just remind you that according to the OECD report, uh, the public expenditure in Israel on health and education is the lower among the OECD countries. And this is exactly what privatization means. So if you want to counter privatization, if you want to counter uh, other ramifications of neoliberalism, you have to restart the project of the welfare state. But then, we're speaking about the state. And the state is the enemy. The state is the sort of person. And if we are taking what we are calling Israeli left, and which is roughly not, which is not exactly Marxist one, not even socialist one, but if we are speaking about all these trends, then they have a very, um, a very, um, a very great problem with this notion of the state. 
Like, for example, the Israeli uh, left is very hostile to the idea of the state because of the occupation. The Israeli left is very fond of uh, all sorts of um, third sector activities which replace the state. Then, if we are speaking for a Marxist analysis about the superstructure philosophical and political of the Israel left, then you see that it had precisely endorsed not only the concept, the anti atheist concepts of neoliberalism, but yet had endorsed all the uh, tools of neoliberalism like the third sector and the um, NGOs yes, and all these things. And uh, where, where does it leave us? I think that if we are speaking about in terms of uh, rejuvenating the welfare state in Israel, then we have to speak to think about the state. And then the Israeli left has to reconsider it, to reconsider its attitude toward the state. I think that the ongoing hostility of the left of Israeli Marxists, of Israeli neo-Marxists, to the state, leaves them in a sort of impotence. And I think that although the problems are here, Jews-Arab relations, occupation, all these questions are here. But I believe that, and I will not elaborate on it now, that as the occupation itself is the outcome of Israeli neoliberalism, I think, I will just recommend my article, The Class Foundations of the Occupation, as a reference to it. I think that if we are going to reconsider a sort of a Marxist interpretation of Israeli uh, reality, I think that, not only Israeli, we have to leave out these post-Marxist notions, these anti-materialistic post-Marxist notions, and endorse other ones, which centered around the class production, <coughs> uh, production relations, politics, and mainly as a first step to state. Thank you. So, unfortunately, not, not unfortunately, but uh, we are really, we are introducing the, the last speaker and uh, uh, that he doesn't have the same time that the others, and I'm already announcing it, because I really think that we should have a discussion, otherwise, what we are here for. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to introduce Amal Jamal, but AI will remain last, and he's going to talk about agency, class, and democracy in the Arab Spring. Uh, hi, good evening, everybody. I, th I uh, thank you very much for the time. Well, be being one of the organizers, I don't mind having shorter time. Uh, despite the big, uh, a huge challenge that uh, Danny Goodwin have uh, laid uh, uh, in front of us, uh, I actually uh, wanted to talk with some, uh, to take you somewhere else. If I had enough time to elaborate what's going on. Uh, from uh, what's going on in the, in the Arab Spring uh, through uh, post-Marxist uh, analysis. But I'm, 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 I'm going to do it in, in my own way because of the short time I, uh, I have. First, I think uh, any, any political and, uh, uh, and ethical analysis cannot be far away from uh, uh, reality. 
And I think an answer to Danny Gutwein and support uh, to Martin, I would say that uh, uh, it's exactly because the change, uh, uh, there are changes taking place in the economic base and its relationship with the superstructure, there is a need for new conceptual <coughs> notions in order to be able to understand what's going on and provide answers uh, to, uh, to this process. I think... Uh, uh, we need a uh, new epistemological uh, analysis uh, uh, exactly because of the transformation, uh, transformations taking place in the meaning of the state and the way it's playing a role in, uh, uh, in, in the political, in the, in the economy, especially at the age of globalization. Now, um, Another, th another idea that I think uh, ha have to be made clear before I enter the issue of the Arab Spring as an example, uh, um, one of the major contributions of, uh, of uh, post-Marxist uh, analysis beyond what Martin has elaborated very nicely, I think is the self-constitution of agency as through performance that uh, agency, political agency, if we speak about a class, and I will elaborate on it uh, in a minute, uh, is not, uh, uh, not pre-given uh, to the political uh, and economic um, uh, uh, structure, but actually uh, is constituted through the interaction within the economic uh, uh, base and its, uh, its uh, interaction with the, with the superstructure which is, as I said, uh, transforming. So um, um, uh, actually we're talking about uh, the relevance of uh, uh, allocation as well as uh, recognition, as Nancy Fraser had nicely, very nicely uh, put it. Uh, but also we have to add that we, we are not talking about um, uh, 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 recognition uh, falling into uh, into the traps of uh, of uh, neoliberal understandings of identity uh, as a tool of control, but rather, uh, uh, and there she differentiates differentiates between uh, affirmative vis-a-vis -vis transformative understandings of uh, of. Uh, uh, of allocation of resources and its relationship with uh, with recognition of identity and the importance of uh, of identity, um, uh, political ethics cannot go beyond demands of people, whether they come from the economic base or from uh, 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 from the uh, other other realms of uh, human uh, human life. So it's very important to take both into account, and I. Uh, uh, I think we have to connect our analysis with our ethos, with our uh, ethics uh, of politics that we want to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, promote. And uh, um, uh, my, my paper, actually, if I had the, the time, so I'm, I'm going to be very short, uh, 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 claims that changes in the meaning of political agency uh, have been a major factor behind political uh, upheavals, whether in Israel or in Europe or in the United States or especially in the Arab world, um, these upheavals have to do with uh, uh, with the need for uh, a, a new understanding of what we uh, call political agency, and uh, uh, and that the classical meaning of class is not sufficient anymore in order to understand uh, what's going on because of the difference. Uh, in the interaction between uh, super, uh, superstructure and economic base. Um, and I think you mentioned a very important uh, notion, uh, the impoverished middle class, as a very important issue, uh, uh, indicating the changes taking place in the relationship between the economic base and the superstructure that has to be integrated in any analysis of what's going on. And I claim there has been an expansion of the educated young middle class uh, in the Arab world, uh, reaching uh, proportions uh, that are, and this is the explanation, uh, I mean, if, if we speak about the expansion of middle class, actually we should speak about more support for the state since these uh, middle class are winning, uh, actually, from the policies followed by the states, but we see actually the opposite taking place, that uh, 
uh, uh, the, the expansion of the educated young middle class uh, reaching propo proportions that are far beyond the ability of the state and the economy to provide them with jobs and satisfy uh, their expectations. So uh, it is uh, a, a, a new phenomena that we have to take into consideration, a new middle class that is completely different than the meaning we used to understand by a middle class. This expansion took place in a structural circumstances that uh, provided the conditional support for the mobilization of a protest movement, meaning that uh, uh, actually the state has been transforming also, and uh, the uh, structural circumstances have been uh, uh, changing, uh, and uh, 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 the structural circumstances uh, I'm talking about could be summed up uh, in two main uh, uh, ch uh, uh, structural changes. One is the failure of the dominant elites to present a universal political formula that overshadow their corruption and the uh, uh, new relationship between their economic interests and, uh, uh, and, and the state. Uh, the economic challenges that have uh, led to huge so socio-economic gaps uh, in society uh, and the expansion of poverty actually uh, indicate the changing role of the state uh, used by uh, these uh, elites, especially when we talk about author corrupt authoritarian elites using the state for, uh, for their own uh, interests. The second structural uh, 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 condition, which is very important to understand, uh, is the centralization of the flow of capital in the hands of influential elites that share, shares positions in the state and the economy, uh, especially when we talk about uh, the globalization period, meaning that the uh, nature of the state, the, our understanding of the state has to be changed uh, because of the role that the state has been playing in the globalization age, uh, which actually force us to go beyond classical Marxist uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, in order to provide a better analysis of what's, what's, uh, uh, what's going on. This, this change in the, uh, uh, in the uh, centralization of the flow of capital uh, is combined with the expansion of the state security apparatus in, in order to suppress the expected protest uh, of the poor public. And I think this is especially in authoritarian regimes, because I'm, I'm, I want to concentrate on the Arab, uh, on the Arab, uh, uh, on the Arab uh, setting and uh, actually explain that these structural changes with the changes in the meaning of the uh, main social agent uh, uh, I think uh, can explain actually uh, the, uh, 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 the timing of the social upheavals that have been uh, taking place in this, uh, uh, in this context. These uh, uh, structural factors facilitated the fusion of, uh, 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 of class interests between the educated young middle class uh, strata and the poor classes, creating actually a new social block that goes beyond the traditional meaning of class. Uh, uh, and this has to be uh, taken into consideration, and therefore there are a need, there is a need for a uh, 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 new understanding of class and uh, meaning in classical uh, uh, Marxist uh, uh, thinking, there is a need for a relook at the meaning of class as the agent of revolution. Because, the, uh, because of this combination between educated middle class and, uh, and poor classes in society, or what I would call following uh, 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 post-Marxist thinkers, uh, uh, the union of the suppressed, uh, which is a, a, a very important uh, conception if we uh, want to understand what's going on. And here I would like to incorporate not only the economic interests of these suppressed classes, but also their, uh, uh, their aspiration to uh, be part of the political system and uh, 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 manifest or uh, 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 play uh, an important role in defining the values or the ethics in which their uh, politics take, uh, take place. Um, 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 so it is, uh, it is the, uh, on the other hand, I mean, we, when we look at this process taking place, uh, 
it is uh, the role of this uh, dominant elite uh, playing a major role in the uh, in the uh, in the state actually to uh, divide and conquer or lead a policy of divide and conquer and therefore uh, um, um, it is not only the common interest against the authoritarian, authoritarian regime that fostered uh, a, a, a new social uh, uh, agency, but it is uh, 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 um, uh, it is the uh, changing structure and the role of the elite uh, uh, dominant in the state that has been trying to actually uh, divide uh, 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 the new union uh, of the suppressed in order to maintain its uh, its power. And I think we see it very clearly in the role that is being taken place in Egypt today by, uh, by uh, 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 the negotiations between the army and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the Islamic, uh, Islamic movement, the Islamic Brotherhood, uh, in order to reach a new formula that enables to maintain at least part of the uh, socio-economic and political structure that uh, serves their, uh, uh, their interests. Um, so, uh, not, therefore, notwithstanding uh, such a coalition, the competition between Islamists and liberal parties for power in Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco demonstrate that the common efforts of the two classes to topple the authoritarian uh, government does not mean that the middle class youth have managed to guarantee the political loyalty of the poor masses uh, to a civic democratic uh, state. These fluid class relations uh, enable uh, the state to play a, 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 a more active role in order to promote the interest of the dominant uh, elite. Uh, but these, these also explain the victory of the Islamic uh, parties in the elections that took place in, the, in Tunisia and Morocco so far, uh, a, re a result that is also expected to ha take place in, in, in Egypt. These new class uh, configurations and the tension related to them demonstrate the changing meaning of class as a political agency on the one hand, and these trends on the other hand uh, uh, form a, a good background to rethink uh, the classical Marxist categories and the need for a new post-Marxist concepts uh, in order to explicate current changes. This theoretical adaptation, which is needed actually because of the changing in the, in the political reality, uh, could contribute to the growing post-Marxist tra tradition and provide a better understanding of ongoing complex socio-political phenomena. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for a mile that is, we kept the time. <laughs> and now the floor is open, is, is open for questions. Now that I fight for the questions, you better have some. You can give me more time. I can tell you already, right? No. So? Can I start? I know it's, it's really, the problem is it's always the same problem that when you combine all those papers and you have so many different comments and or questions about each one of them. And, but I think it's striking, um, perhaps with the exception of Anat's paper, um, which was just brilliant. I mean, even like t going into that, the, the notion of ethics and putting that on the table was like changing the whole um, way of looking at, at, at the question. We're, and we've been debating about this for over a year now. And, um, but, but when I, but it was striking that you all took us back to economy, and we were talking deeply into materialistic and economic factors and questions. And um, I remember the first meeting that we had of this group um, when we were we read Laclau and Moff, and we were trying to think if that applies to us at all, and in what way does it apply to what we're talking about, and, um, and thinking about post-Marxism. And one of the main themes that um, they discussed was the collapse of the notion of the revolution. And they used it to demonstrate and to talk about new kinds of antagonism and, um, and in what ways we can, you know, people demonstrate their passion and um, and, and I remember at the beginning of the year I was talking about, well, that they overlooked the fact that the great, one great revolution that happened, there was a collapse of the 
um, the, uh, the, the former Soviet Union and all the states. And we even talked about some of the prophecies of like Nazir Yubi that I, I, I quoted saying, you know, just imagine something like that happens in the Middle East and how would the states collapse one after the other. And revolution can be endemic, and, um, and, and I throw that back to you guys and see if you can play and do something with it. So? <laughs> You, you should. Are we collecting or? No, I'm not collecting. There was not a question, it was a comment. Just a second, please. Very yeah, go ahead. The collapse of the notion of revolution. Um, I think it would be necessary to differentiate different notions of mm -hmm. revolution and not only to think about the one single revolution. Um, the notion of revolution is so overdetermined by the French and Soviet revolutions. Um, maybe the American one. Probably most, most the French and the Soviet revolutions. Um, and particularly, I think, due to these two, there seems to be the promise of a, a completely new start, something entirely new uh, and never heard of is going to happen. Um, and also, um, the abolition of whatever was before completely. Um, and also, it bears the promise of something messianic happening, that we will all be um, delivered from whatever sins there are in politics or in, in, in the society. And, and this overdetermined notion of revolution is probably something that we cannot stand up to anymore. And, and this is probably also what I, well, this is my interpretation of, like, 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 of what Leclerc and Mouffe argue. Um, that this big, let's call it the big notion of revolution, that this is passé in a, in a, in a way. Um, uh, and I think that makes sense because historically when we look back to those two revolutions that I was talking about, of course, it was not the case that it was messianic in, in any sense. And, and it, it, of course, there was a backlash always. And, and it, it was bloody and it was miserable. And it, it, it was not really um, what everyone had hoped for in, in the beginning. There may, however, be, beside this big revolution, the revolution, still a notion of many tiny little revolutions that happen over and over again, and that step by step may lead to better circumstances in a way. And I wouldn't want to skip that. I, I just wouldn't want to jettison that from, from, from my ship. Danny? I don't know why, why I think about this notion of uh, Laclau and Timof. I think about Fukuyama, um. about the uh, end of history. I think that uh, what really Leclerc and Moff said is essentially, essentially, something very similar in a different way, from a different perspective, from a different background, but essentially speaking about the politics of the late 20th century, we are speaking about the same notion, the end of history, the end of revolution, this is the same. And I think that it is the way that um, they adjusted themselves to the great new liberal dream. And uh, I think that what is interesting here, the similarity that those both post-Marxist great thinkers and this great neoliberal prophet say exactly the same thing. And I think that the notion of revolution, if, taking, if, uh, if I understand anything about Marxist understanding of the term revolution, is not a barricade, it's not a shooting, it's not a kind of mob running around. It's something completely different. Revolution 
is a political term that's connected to politics, to connected to economics. Industrial revolution, there is not only the Soviet and the French revolution, the, the term for revolution is much more complex, I think, in Marxist uh, um, tradition. Uh, but there was the need to nullify revolution. There was the need to nullify politics in the way that post-Marxism adjusted to neoliberalism. Could I answer? To yes, that of one? course. <laughs> you you should. I would, I would really heavily disagree. Uh, um, uh, I think it is the notion of revolution, the big revolution itself, that ends history, and not uh, so. So the argument for for consecutive many little revolutions is exactly what is historical, uh, and is exactly not the same as, as Fukuyama's idea of the, of the end of history. It is, if you look at, 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 the, at the Gramscian idea of political forces continuing to interact, uh, reacting to each other, trying to balance each other out, and it's not only what he called civil society, it, it is of course also the military and the state and, and, and politics. Um, so, um, and the economy, not to forget. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I think the end of history is closer to, to the idea of, a, to a certain idea of, of the communist revolution than vice versa. Uh, I, w I would like to, yeah, I would like to support yes. that very much. Uh, uh, Martin's, I mean, um, Martin's understanding. <coughs> I think uh, if you continue reading uh, Laclau and Moff uh, uh, together and separately, you see that actually what they mean is that uh, this type of, of, of revolution is, is over, which means, yeah, the end of history, I would like, I like your notion very much, uh, whereas they view revolution as uh, uh, the finding new ways of uh, 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 solving or, or dealing with antagonism within society without, uh, without dreaming that antagonism could be abolished completely. That antagonism is part of politics, and when, when you speak about politics without revolution, then you're, you're not speaking about politics, actually. And this is, this is actually, when, when, when Moff uh, uh, explains, uh, speaks about the political, actually, that's exactly what, what, what she wants to assert. A political reality in which antagonism is, is, a, is part, uh, as part of a human society where uh, political agents transform themselves and perform themselves as part of the human, their human agency within, of course, the economic and political structure in which this process takes place. So this, she, she doesn't uh, overcome the importance of economy and doesn't ov uh, overcome the importance of, uh, of, uh, 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 of uh, economic base, but actually relocates it within politics as a very important factor explaining that interests uh, determine antagonism as a central part or essential even part of politics. And therefore revolution in a new notion, in a new understanding, is what, she, what they both uh, would like to promote. And that's what they mean in the 1986 book, actually, or early 80s, uh, the Hebrew version in 1986, uh, in, in the early 80s book, uh, that, yeah, the notion of revolution as a big... Uh, 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 a big, huge uh, change that ends history uh, and uh, is messianic, as you said, Martin, is over because of the sophistication of the control system promoted by the liberal or neoliberal uh, politics. They adapt their notion of revolution to the sophistication taking place within the neoliberal system and they say that the, uh, there is a need for a different understanding of revolution in order to compete <coughs> with such changes and sophistication of politics. So you are talking about management? No, I'm not. But, okay. Uh, Anat. Anat. I want to disagree with all of you, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I naturally disagree with Dani because, well, actually, I'll, I'll get to you later. I, 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 I would, despite of the fact that I do agree with the general trend, but but I would leave open the possibility of a revolution. I mean, th this is something that I don't want to rule out as an end of history, or as, I mean, it it may happen, 
I mean, this is why I don't buy the whole the whole baggage of Laclau and Mouffe. I mean, I think there is there is such an option. But for this, and this is where I disagree with you, Danny. Uh, for this, we have something that, a necessary condition. We have to imagine very clearly. We have to have a very precise vision of what it would be, a precise imaginative vision of what the world would be without private property. And we cannot do this. This is a fact. I mean, uh, uh, we, we thought we did, but we don't have it any longer. I mean, and, and without the imagining this, there's no, there's no way of talking about revolution, I think. I mean, revolution of a welfare state is not a revolution. This is, this is, it, it, it is very remote from any revolutionary uh, vision. So once we, dis once, I hope we, we will, but once we succeed in imagining or in having a clear vision, a detailed vision of what a world would be without private property, maybe then we'll manage to have a revolution. I don't see it happening tomorrow, but... Let's hope. Do you want to... I have something I else to ask. The question of revolution, if I understand it as a process, not the, you know, as a war or something like it, upheaval, if I understand revolution as sort of a process which is different from other processes that are taking place in society. And going back to your notion of private power property, I think that we are speaking about socializing about socializing. What is the end of, what is the negation of private property? It is socializing. So, how, so from, I think, well, I'm, I'm speaking from my own understanding or from, from own learning. It's not my own understanding. It's my own learning. It's my learning. Studying this, I think we are speaking about socializing. And I do, I think that if we are looking about the, um, the, the, the history of, uh, of Marxist in the 20th century, I think that we can speak about uh, the great um, theories of defeat. I think that what uh, Marxists uh, have witnessed in the 20th century that their uh, basic uh, interpretation didn't work. Uh, in the beginning of the, in the first half of the century came fascism, and then came the welfare state, and then new liberalism. So I think that all the time, if you are taking the um, Frankfurt School, if you, if, if, and then be short yeah, because we are taking, running out of time. If you are taking, if you are taking the Frankfurt School, if you are taking Gramsci, if you are taking the new Marxists, there are all ways of adjusting to the place where the prophecy didn't materialize. And I don't see materialism, uh, Marxism as a prophecy. I see it as an analysis. And I think that as an analysis, uh, and, and I think that post-Marxism is, is, uh, is uh, regarding it more than a prophecy, than an analysis. And from this point, I think that this cleavage begins. Okay, unfortunately, there is someone that want to ask the last question? Please, Simon. I think uh, well, I am I'm sitting next to uh, Amal and I'm a very little expert about what's going on in the Arab world, I have to admit, but from my, um, from my uh, Marxist uh, upbringing, I would say that the uh, Muslim countries are in a different stage of industrialization. <coughs> I think that we have very, to be um, very modest in our uh, way of implementing our understanding of, uh, of, of uh, paradigms that we are uh, dealing in, uh, that we are analyzing Israel or other places. <coughs> the, the, con the concept of Muslim revolution is only, it's a metaphor here. It's not corresponding to the, to the, um, to the, um, to the revolution that we speak about here. It's a metaphor of a very convenient one, but I think that we are speaking about a different society. And we have to, uh, well, I want to learn more about these revolutions before I can say that I can take them into this part. Mm. Okay, we have to conclude, unfortunately. 
We don't have to, if you want to. St um, I would have driver ask, yeah. but there is a taxi outside. So I thank you very much for having participated today to the workshop. It was like a workshop, in fact. And uh, I hope to, that we will continue our, the discussion in the group.